Bienvenido y saludos amigos. My name is Bobby Sanabria. Welcome to another edition of Music by the Book here on the place to be, the BMHC. I'm talking about the Bronx Music Heritage Center. And as you well know, in our Music by the Book series, we always have a guest author and we interview them about their latest work. And to introduce this episode of Music by the Book, how about it for the creator of the series and the core artistic director, along with yours truly, Bobby Sanabria of the Bronx Music Heritage Center and the forthcoming Bronx Music Hall, the one and only Elena Martinez. Hi everyone, welcome to the Bronx Music Heritage Center. Happy 2022. I know um we're I know we're a month into it, but we haven't seen um everyone in a while, so it's great to be back. Um, even virtually, but soon enough we'll be we'll be doing live events with everyone. Um, you know, at, at the new space, um, hopefully live um, at the Bronx Music Heritage Center, but the Bronx Music Hall and the outside plaza soon. But tonight, as Bobby mentioned, we have our Music by the Book series. Before we get into that, I just want to give a shout out to our funders. The Bronx Music Heritage Center program is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, with the support of the governor, the New York State Legislature, and public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund, and the Howard Gilman Foundation. So we want to thank our funders for making all our programming possible. And tonight, um, as we start off um, Black History Month, and also there's, um, we're also here a special um, date tonight, which I'll let um, our guests talk about, which we're, um, in, we're here on February 3rd in homage to a date um, that happened on February 5th, which we'll get to. But today we're going to be talking to the um, Jose Francisco Avila, who is the author of this book I have here, um, Pan Garifuna Afro-Latina Pride. So he's going to be talking about his book, and um, we're going to ask him some questions about his book. Um, and then we, ha all of you watching on Facebook, please put in any questions you have for Jose in the Facebook comments section, and then we'll get a chance to ask Jose live, and he can respond to you live here. And we're so glad to have Jose here. Jose. Um, Francisco Avila is a member of the New York City Garifuna community. He is one of the founders of the Garifuna Coalition, and he's also on the Bronx Music Heritage Center's advi Music Advisory Board. So we're so happy to have him here with us tonight, and welcome, Jose. And we welcome also, besides Jose, everybody who's tuning in from the Garifuna community. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Elena. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here joining you for this event. Uh, we've done many live events over the years. It is a pleasure and an honor, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, um, we're going to just start. I'm going to start off with a, a couple, um, ask you a couple questions um, and some brief introductory stuff that you have talk about in the book. And then Bobby will jump in on some questions and we'll, we'll see how the questions come in. Okay. Um, this is your book, this book that you, um, that you wrote last year. Um, it's sort of like a mix of a lot of a Garifuna history of sort of like um, pre-colonial history, um, more recent history, as well as um, um, contemporary history of, of uh, you know, the community in New York City and, and, and the community in the diaspora. But it also is mixed in with your memoir, the memoir of you growing up Garifuna and your sort of journey from Honduras through different cities in, New York, in, in the United States and then here to New York. But let's begin, if you can just briefly, because this could take another, this could be a whole other um, class or, you know, series. Um, the little bit of, you give a little bit of the Garifuna history. For folks who don't know who the Garifuna are, what it was a really brief history of the Garifuna people? Well, the Garifuna people are an Afro-Indigenous people. The mixture occur in the island of St. Vincent. And that's where we are originally from. Our ancestors actually hail from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They fought the British for over 30 years, defending uh, their land in St. Vincent. And because of that, and because of their love for freedom, uh, they were actually forcibly deported to the island of Roatan off the coast of Honduras, which was already colonized by the Spaniards. And then eventually they negotiated with the Spaniards and allowed them to cross over to the mainland. Uh, and they did that and they kept walking east, ended up in Nicaragua, kept walking west, ended up in Belize and Guatemala. And today the Garifuna diaspora is located in those four, uh, four countries, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua in Central America. And through the process of immigration today, the largest Garifuna population uh, outside of Central America is right here in New York City. That's a brief history. 
<laughs> that's really uh, that's really brief. That the elevator pitch for yeah, the history. Wait, wait, before, before we go on, what year are we talking about this uh, expulsion from the island of St. Vincent? Thank you, Bobby. That that had, expulsion actually, uh, again, they fought the British for over 30 years. Uh, they couldn't subdue him. And they eventually they rounded up 5,000 of my ancestors and uh, actually exiled them, forced them to an island called Baliso. Uh, the prime minister of St. Vincent actually refers to Baliso as saying that the only beings that could survive there were reptiles. And that's mm -hmm. where my people would actually send for six months. Half the population, over 2,500, died in that island. The other half that survived on March 11, 1797, were loaded onto ships that took to the ocean. They had no idea where they were being sent to. The ships arrived to Rotan in April 12, 1797. And so it's that 1797, the fighting started, it lasted over 30 years. It started in uh, around 1767, 68. And so, and again, it culminated in 1795 with the uh, death of the Paramount Chief, Joseph Chatelier. And then after his death was when they were forcibly deported. So it was 1797. And, and actually, speaking of, um another historical point, because, you know, we're talking about Black History Month. One of the things you talk about, you know, you make mention of in your book, and I've heard about this before, because we did some programming on it. Um, in 1823, William Henry Brown, who's, who's recognized as like, the first playwright of the African American, of African American descent, um, wrote, or in the United States, wrote the drama of King Shottaway. And Shottaway, of course, is a paramount chief. He's this iconic figure in Garifuna history. So he wrote this drama of King Shottaway, which is recognized as the first black drama of American theater. Can you tell us who was William Henry Brown and how did he know the Garifuna story? Well, there are many stories. I, I have researched it. Uh, and, and actually, you know, uh, our good, good friend Ray Allen uh, actually was the one that made the discovery because he, he is into the theater. And he was the one that did the, uh, the discovery of the, of the play. And again, but I've done it. But the way you if, you, uh, if you Google William Henry Brown, they'll tell you that he was, as they were called back then, a West Indian man. Now we call him Caribbean. Right? But they refer to him as a West Indian man who supposedly worked in a ship. And basically, that's how he ended, he ended up in New York. And they also describe that based on the play, they assumed that he must have had some exposure to the fighting, which basically assumes that he was from St. Vincent and the Grenadine, uh, which is where, where, I mean, where originally came, came from. But yes, but he, uh, he created the first theater in New York, the Af African uh, theater in New York. And through that theater, he uh, basically used to do different European plays, recreate them and so forth. And eventually he decided to create his own and created the drama of King Shotaway with premiere uh, in New York City on June 20 and 21st, 1823. And it became, it's recognized as the first African-American play produced in the United States by a black man. Wow. That's so, incredible. I mean, that's, so, that's almost next year. It'll be um, two decades, 200, 200, 200 years. years. Yeah. Exactly. Do you exactly. know what theater it, uh, they premiered the work? Do you, uh... I, I believe it's called the African House of the African Theater. Uh, where, where we, we, he actually... This man was so brilliant and was amazing. All of this was happening while slavery hadn't been abolished in New York right. State. Uh, so, so that under those circumstances, but he actually created his own theater house to cater to the African American, uh, Black Americans, as they were called back then, back then. And he recognized that there was an audience within that that population. Uh, and he had the talent. So he created his own theater. And according to what I read and everything, that, and this is, is all documented, he did it uh, with the opposition of the white population who didn't want him. As a matter of fact, the reason that we haven't found the script for the play is because the theater was eventually burned down. But yes, he created his, his, his own theater. It's right around the Soho area. Uh, around that area, it's actually in Manhattan. It was not even the Bronx or Brooklyn. It was right, right, right in Manhattan. So he was the pioneer with, in the theater industry of New York, New York City. So the the actual manuscript of this work does not exist at all. It, no one has been able to find it. And again, he, uh, the story goes that again he was opposed 
uh, they raided his theater and eventually burned it down and the script disappeared. And so far, I haven't found anyone. I haven't spoken to it. I watch uh, shows. I watch conferences from African-Americans about, about it. And no one in and, and all the documentation indicates that no one has been able to place a copy of the manuscript for the play. Mm. Wow, that's unfortunate. Hopefully, maybe one day it'll turn up in somebody's trunk. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Well, and it, the good thing about it, uh, Elena mentioned that, uh, if you remember the way our relationship started with the Bronx Music Heritage Center was actually uh, Helena, Elena found uh, Sydney, the late Sidney Mejia's book, uh, The Times of Joseph Chatier. And we were talking and we were discussing what, how we could join forces and when she saw the book, she's like, you know what? As because uh, he was actually a part of Bronze Week, which is May, which is actually uh, we recognize May as the Garifuna Intangible Heritage Month. Uh, so we were talking that, and Elena read the story, and she goes, you know, it would be great if we could do it. And I contacted Sydney Mejia, who lived in Los Angeles, California. We made arrangements. Uh, Sydney came and did the reading uh, with some uh, uh, some drummers and, and so forth. And that was the beginning of it. I still have the pictures. I still have um, yep. the sign at the entrance of the Bronx Music Heritage Center and uh, the pictures and the videos of, of that event. So, but that's how it, start, it started. But yes, uh, Sidney is the only one. And he, and he wrote the book trying to recreate the, the manuscript. So, you know, we'll have to revisit that because it is coming up 200 years. So that's we'll right. have to revisit yes. that. Um, so, but before we go any further, I did mention, because originally we were thinking about February 5th for this program. There's, what's the significance of February 5th? Well, before I talk about, uh, quickly, I'll tie it all into one. Uh, I'm glad that we were doing it uh, February 5th, but I'm glad that we, and it's happening tonight, because tonight is the eighth anniversary of the death of Miss Dionisia Bonilla Amaya, whom we all call Mama Nicha. Um, she was the matriarch of the Garifuna community here in New York. She was actually my right-hand person. Uh, she was uh, the person that supported me when I started all of it. And the significance of February 5th is the fact that on February 5th, 1989, I actually held the first Garifuna community organizing meeting right here in the Bronx at 671 Prospect Avenue. Club Cubano Internacional. Wow. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the Club Cubano the history with you. The legendary Club the Cubano. The legendary Cubano. Club Cubano Internacional. That's where we held the first ever Garifuna organized meeting on February 5th, 1989. It was at that meeting that I met Miss, the late Miss Dionisia Amaya Bonilla, Mama Nicha, and we became inseparable until her death eight, eight years ago. So yeah, that is the significance that today is the 80th anniversary of death. Uh, Saturday is the 34th anniversary of that meeting. As a matter of fact, I went, I went by recently and now uh, that building is becoming a charter school in the Bronx. Yeah, uh, the, it, the Club Cubano has an interesting history, but I'm exactly. so glad that we can honor um, Ms. Bonilla um, on the say, because the Bronx is full of um, great women activists who did who's exactly. changed the Bronx and in the city. So, um, so now just to switch back into the, you know the book is about you integrate as I mentioned you know Garifuna history mm -hmm. and your own story, okay, you know and you know you grew up in Honduras you go, you went to school in Boston, um, you know then you worked in Dallas and there's a large Garifuna community in sort of an, in Houston, um, exactly. New Orleans um, area, mm -hmm. and then in 1998 you moved to New York City, which is of course the other the largest um, Garifuna community in the diaspora. Right. Um, it was really interesting. Can you can you just talk tell a little bit about your story, your journey? Mm -hmm. But also, it's really interesting reading about. Um, you said some of the greatest cultural moments for you came when you heard the Motown release of "On um, the Jackson Five, when yeah. you heard, you know, James Brown music and Bob Marley music. So, you know, the Black Power movement also influenced you. And there's actually some pictures of you with an afro in there during that um, <laughs> era in the book. Um, exactly. You know, so all this influenced you. I mean, you're 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 bringing in your Garifuna influence, but also that what all was happening in the United States with the. Um, you know, black power movement. And just maybe talk a little bit about sort of this, your formation as sure. in, in of this. Sure. Uh, and I'll have to start by saying that I, I would, like I said, I was born in the Garifuna village of Cristales, which is now what they call a barrio, 
of the city of Trujillo. That's where I was born. And I was raised in the city of La Ceiba, which is still up to today, the third largest and most important city in Honduras. That's where I did my elementary school. And the significance of the book and, and telling all of that is the fact that through all those years, I knew that I was Garifuna, but I didn't know what Garifuna was because it was not taught in the school. Uh, my parents didn't talk about it. My grandmothers, who I really was the one I grew up with, uh, didn't talk about it. So I had no idea what, what it was. And then I, at the age of 15, I migrated with my parents to Boston, Massachusetts, right in the midst of the desegregation of America. I tell young people, uh, you, you read about the segregation. I lived it. You read about white flag. I lived it. I know exactly what all that means. So that's the environment in which I came to America. Uh, as, uh, and I always like to say, it's a year after Martin Luther, Luther King was killed. It's, and as a result of that, as you mentioned, it is the era of the uh, Black Power Movement. I also tell young people, yes, I did wear an Afro. I did wear a dashiki. But back then, those were not fashion statements. Those were political statements. It was the reconnection with Africa of uh, 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 Black people here. So that, that is the, the era that, that I grew up now. And, and again, <clears throat> I, I still didn't know what Garifuna was, but I come into this environment where I, I like to say, and I mention it in the book, black whites will call me black, but black Americans as they will call them will call me foreigner because I didn't speak English at the time. And my name is not John Smith or Jack Johnson. My name is Jose Francisco Avila Lopez. And it's like, again, I didn't speak the language at the time. So they used to refer to me as a foreigner. That rejection is what I like to say, was what generated that interest, the interest in finding out about my heritage, about my ancestors. Who are, who are we? I know that I'm Garifuna, but who are the Garifuna? And that's what led me to uh, pick my interest. But in Boston, I was assimilating, so that's where I went to junior high, high school, that's where I went to Bentley University, and eventually that's where I started my first job and so forth, so that's what it was all about. My, me, I started my family and so forth. To yeah. me, it's amazing you don't have a Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> you, but I, you, I'm curious. You're, you're yeah. amazed that I would say I pat the car in the back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. So when people met you, whether they were white, whether they were black in Boston, because I went to college in Boston, so I can yeah. attest to the, to the racism that was uh, present right. there at the time in the mid 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, to, I, I went to the Berkeley College of Music 75, graduated in 79. You were there a little bit earlier. Right. So when they met you, did they think, did they say to you, what are you, Puerto Rican, Cuban? Did they, or they even say that at all? Or the, you know, no, and that's a very good uh, question. Uh, no, it was, again, I was a foreigner. That, that was it. Because I, I like to say, you know, the term Hispanic or Latino didn't exist. Uh, there was a very, in the neighborhood that we lived, Dorchester, it was a mix, it was Caribbean. Uh, but also, I, uh, through uh, my research, I found out that when we arrived, it was at the tail end of the last Black migration from the south of the United States to the north. Uh, specifically Boston. So we ended up in a, a neighborhood that was a mix. There was a small Puerto Rican community that was developing at that time. And we were like three or four blocks away. So we would play together, you know, hablábamos español, jugábamos. There was Garifunas from Honduras also. So we, you know, we started developing uh, that uh, little community and so forth. But overall, no, uh, it was not easy to assimilate because again, um, I, we were not, uh, I was not accepted. We were rejected. Eventually it did by the summer, uh, you know, we, you, you had freedom. We were riding bikes and so forth. And we started acculturating and mixing. And by then, of course, I uh, had learned uh, the English language and that made the transition a little bit. But it was not easy. I was talking with someone recently from Fordham University. We were talking about it. And I said, and she's from Boston. And I, and I said, I've heard that Boston being referred as the most racist city in the world and I, in, in the United States. And I said, but that's the environment that I grew in. And again, that's what generated the interest of trying to find out where I was. Eventually, I, I had an interview with them recently and I mentioned that eventually what led me to move from Boston was because all of this, schools started being desegregated through busing. 
and Boston mm -hmm. became a lightning rod uh, for, with the white population. I was out of high school. I, I was out of college when, when, when this happened. But my son uh, it was 18 months old, and we decided that we didn't want to raise our son in that environment. My nieces and nephews were actually bused from Dorchester to Redding, Needham, all the suburbs around uh, around Boston. That was there, you know, to be able to get an education. And we decided we didn't want to do that. So that's why in 1981, uh, uh, well, 40 years ago, we decided to relocate to Dallas, Texas, which was a totally different experience. But yeah, that it, but that was my beginning. That was my growing up. <laughs> Uh, being born in the Garifuna village, and raised in the city in Honduras, and moving to one of the most prominent, but at the same time, most racially divided cities in the United States, uh, which is called Boston, Massachusetts. Now, well, tell us a little bit about uh, about your moving to Dallas. I mean, Dallas is <laughs> is not known as a uh, was not known as a hotbed of uh, acceptance or, or cultural diversity at the time uh, tell us a little, how was that uh, sure, and, and sure. what what brought you to dallas was it a job offering or, or? no uh, you know i've been asked <clears throat> that question <clears throat> many times is you know so how did you decide to move to dallas how did you decide to move to new york and so forth and basically my answer is <clears throat> i never i every move that i made is based on better opportunities for myself and my family and at that time, as I was graduating from Bentley University, uh, my first job was actually with the Internal Revenue Service, IRS. Mm -hmm. I was one of those guys that went around uh, auditing people's tax return. Uh, <clears throat> and, I, and that was part of the implementation of the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, which again, part of the segregation, that's what they now, now is being called diversity. Well, back then it was to give us people of color an opportunity to participate. So that's how I ended up working for the Internal Revenue Service. And that was great and so forth. But again, it was my son and we didn't want him to grow in that environment. Uh, Dallas, well, Texas was booming because of mm. oil, of the oil industry. Mm. So one third of my graduating class from Bentley University in 1980, 81, ended up moving to <clears throat> that, uh, to Texas, either Dallas or Houston. As a matter of fact, at that time, the auto industry had was had crashed. So a lot of Michigan people you know, actually moved. moved you know. So this exodus from the north to the south, it's not new, it's still happening. But I was part of that exodus and when it was when Texas was uh, booming. So I did that and uh, I transferred to Dallas. So I got a, a, an opportunity to be hired by an accounting firm, a public accounting firm, and that's what led me to move there. I call that transition culture shock, because just like you say, Bobby, this is not the bedrock of anything dealing with integration and, and so forth. But it <clears throat> and it was different, and and again, I refer to it as, as culture shock. The, the culture shock was the fact that at least in in Boston, in spite even uh, yeah, I was called a foreigner. But there were Black Puerto Ricans, there were Black Hondurans, there were Panamanians. People knew that there were Blacks in Latin America. In Dallas, that whole concept didn't exist. And so the whole idea that, what, you? How can you be Hispanic? How can you be Latino? How can you speak Spanish? So that's what I mean about culture shock. Uh, but again, I made it through. Uh, eventually, I, I was with the accounting firm for a year this year. It's 40 years that I started working for, then I trained, I was able to uh, be hired by uh, a te technology company. Uh, it was called Computer Language Research, Fast Stacks. And I like, I, I mentioned it in the book, what's interesting, Fast Stacks is what today is called Turbo Tax. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beginning of the, pro of the automation of tax preparation. Uh, it, it was that company that hired me. And, and so, so I worked with them. Now, in the, so in the importance of that, once I adapted to the culture shock and so forth and started making friends, oh, and I had to say this because I mentioned it in the book. So culture shock, uh, it was in Dallas that I'll say it, a white woman asked me, what exactly are you? You look black, but you speak Spanish. 
well, I'm a black man that happens to be born in a Spanish speaking country. And that's why I speak Spanish. Oh, and by the way, I'm Garifuna. What in the world is that? That was not the word. That <laughs> well, there's knew. still, I mean, there's still, there's still a, incredibly a lot of people are, don't know this, right? I mean, wasn't, <laughs> didn't President Bush, when George W. Bush was in office, he asked someone, he was in Brazil and he goes, oh, there's black people in Brazil. <laughs> like, I mean, like, there's still, unfortunately, a lot of um, Thank you. ignorance on, on the, on that topic. Um, I, you know, absolutely. And, and you know, when you were in Dallas, um, da- Houston, it's actually Houston, Texas, and like New Orleans have like large Garifuna communities. Mm-hmm. Now here in New York, there's a lot of Hondurans in the Bronx and Belize mm-hmm. and Belize uh, members in Brooklyn. Right. What's the, what's the sort of national makeup like in Houston and New Orleans? Is it, is it more like from one country, Guatemala, Nicaragua, or well, is it uh, different? It's a very good question. Uh, no, uh, well, uh, the largest Garifuna diaspora is from Honduras. Uh, and I and I say that and I emphasize that because there are some people within the community that resent that, but that's those are the facts. The largest Garifuna diaspora is from Honduras. The largest diaspora in Central America is Honduras, and it has to do with the fact again it's history. We didn't know that's where the ships landed when they got to Central America. Uh, it, as a result, all throughout the United States, well, as a matter of fact, for instance, I, and I'll just will describe it the way I describe the population here in New York. So when I did my research and when I concluded that it's, it's the largest Garifuna population outside of Central America, everyone assumed that I was talking about the Honduran population until I explained and in them I'm talking about the elected officials. And I said, no, when I say that is because it has to do with the fact that the largest Honduran but Garifuna population outside of Honduras is right here. The largest the second largest Garifuna population outside of Belize is right here. The first is in Los Angeles, California. The largest Guatemalan Garifuna population outside of Central America is right here also, divided mm-hmm. between the Bronx and Brooklyn. So it is those three groups that when I'm, when I'm referring to. And now I must add the St. Vincent and the Grenadines diaspora, the ancestral homeland of the Garifuna, which is in Brooklyn along, along with the Belizean. So when I talk about uh, the largest, I'm saying it's 250,000 Garifuna is from all these countries, but still the largest uh, uh, the diaspora are from Honduras. When I started all of this, one of the challenges was, the initial challenge was identity in promoting us as Garifuna. And it has to do with the fact that even when I moved to New York uh, in, in, in 98, uh, people used to refer to uh, Garifuna as Los Hondureños, the Hondurans. That's how, that, that's how they referred to it. Oh, Los Hondureños. You know, because it was like, remember my experience in Dallas, well, you know, how can you be in? And, well, then it's like, well, every black person from Honduras, like, uh, uh, every black person from Honduras is a Hondureño. That's the way. So when, when we started the Garifuna Coalition, our <clears throat> first task was to promote the Garifuna identity and to break the barriers of nationality or hometown or, of, of origin, but identify as Garifuna, which is how we were able to achieve so, so much. And that was when people start, finally started call, calling us the Garifuna. And that's when they, we educated people that Garifunas were not only from Honduras. And that's why we prefer to be called Garifuna. Now, in the case of Honduras, it's really interesting because, you know, we for many years at the Bronx Music Heritage Center have been doing this program, Paranda con Paranda. And of course, that's how you know Jorge. Jorge is our musical director during right. Paranda con Paranda. And, um, you know, we always bring Garifuna and Puerto Rican musicians together on different around mm-hmm. different themes because there's a lot of connections, um, you know, musically, culturally. And, um, you know, one thing reading in your book, you talk you talk a bit about the um, how you know the, the how you know this product of colonialism, American colonialism, where all these um United Fruit Company, the Standard Fruit Company, um, all their subsidiaries went into Honduras, mm-hmm. um, you know, to create these like fruit um, of course plantations and a lot of logging as well in places in Honduras. Not only were got even displaced off their land, um, but the other sort of um effect of that is all that stuff has to be shipped out. So that's another thing that the Puerto Ricans and Garifuna have in common. So like shipping lines, the the the, the, right. the placement of shipping lines really that's why Puerto Ricans came to New York. There were shipping lines between Puerto Rico and New York. Hey, right. you jump on the boat. And so so in the same way, the Hondurans, there was this um large shipping industry in Honduras and many um, a lot of men, I guess, worked as merchant marines on the on, on the in the on the ships and, and and came to the maritime headquarters 
here in New York City. So, right. um, so it's sort of like this effect of like um, colonialism um, exactly. really affected migration. Yeah. Um, and you, you talk about that in the book. But one thing is interesting is that even though you talk about that, I've heard groups from other countries, maybe like um, some indigenous communities, um, are you know don't like to recognize the um, the national sort of government from the, the whatever country they're from mm -hmm. because that cover that government usually treats them not really well. But I noticed in the in the Garifuna, even though you guys are all like you're very much we're, we're Garifuna, we're Garifuna. You guys at events, I've seen the Honduran flag, right? You'll mm -hmm. bring out the Honduran flag, so you do recognize. Are you? Is there like a pride to being Honduran in Guatemala as well as Garifuna too, or um, what do you? What's the dynamics there? It, 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 it is part. It, it, it has to do with our, our resilience, which is why 225 years later, here we are talking about Garifuna in the largest city the capital of the world, uh, it, it, it's, it's our resilience. And part of that resilience is our adaptability. I'll mention, you mentioned that uh, how, you know, we do paranda with paranda. Well, paranda is, is, the, is the Spanish version of Garifuna is adapting Spanish music back in, I don't even know when, but mm -hmm. it was part of the seven. That's when they discovered the, uh, the guitar. And that's where Paranda uh, uh, originates. It's that fusion with Spanish music. And that's what we've done, whatever we go. In, prior to that, it was, uh, remember we did an event also uh, at the VHMC uh, with, with the Gunche. Yep. The Gunche is the French, the Garifuna's adaptation of a French ballroom dancing. It's called Gunche, which is why it's so, it's so formal. And I mentioned all of that. That's why we're here 225 years later, because while we have resisted, we have resisted by maintaining our identity. And I read this somewhere and I love it. And I, and now, and I repeat it. Uh, Garifunas have a, a tendency and a way of adapting other people's culture, turning it into us, and then eventually it becomes the Garifuna way. That's what we do. And that's how we, we, we have survived up, up, over the years. Uh, and again, to answer your question, it's the same thing with government. Uh, we recognize that we were, are a nation in exile. We recognize that. But at the same time, again, we adapted uh, in Honduras. We adapted in the Belize. We adapted in Guatemala. We adapted in Nicaragua, where we have been able to coexist with the indigenous, the Spaniards, and all the other foreigners that came after us to Honduras. Uh, so, and, and, and again, it is part of that survivability, to, to, uh, to, to use that word. Uh, that's what has allowed us to survive for over 225 years. But the essence of it is the resilience of maintaining our own identity, including the language, which even though we mix and so forth, again, we still recognize as being now, in term, I want to say, um, we have a couple of questions. I want to take a, give you a couple of questions. Um, we have with us Professor Bob Ramos and his classes from Rutgers, two of his classes from Rutgers. So we want to thank all them for joining in tonight. And Bob Ramos, Professor Bob Ramos, has um, a couple of things. He talks about, he mentions, you know, you had talked about in 1797, the, um, the deportation from the island to um, Honduras. And then but is there, it was, has there been, in, since that two, over 200 years, has there been a continued Garifuna fighting um, and struggle against the Spaniard, the Spanish um, imperial rule? And I guess later on when Honduras, Honduras became a, independent of um, Spain, was there, so was there sort of resistance um, fighting, you know, things that went on in, in, um, in Central America among the Garifuna community and the Spanish government? Thank you for the question, Professor Ramos. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, right now, because it's Black History Month, so I'm writing different articles about, and I'm starting uh, with the past. What's interesting is that, again, part of that resilience and adaptability is the fact that my ancestors actually joined the independence fight for Honduras. And as a matter of fact, my uh, brothers from Belize ended up in Belize because Right after in, in the, in the, the independence of Honduras, Central America, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica was uh, September 15, 1821. So we were already there, you know, which is why we get even like to say, 
we got to Honduras before Honduras was a republic. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, it, Honduras found us. Uh, and so, but again, uh, but that was 1821. The fight went on, and then between 1827 and 1831, there was a civil uh, civil war in Central America. M interesting enough, Garifunas joined both sides of the fight, including Nicaragua in, 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 in Guatemala in, in Honduras. But, but they, they uh, Francisco Morazan, who was El Paladin, he was the, the one who fought for independence. Uh, some Garifunas joined them, and they also joined the other group that was fighting against them. The group that was fighting, he eventually won, and the group that lost eventually is what caused many Garifunas, and specifically Alejo Beni, who is very known in the least history. Alejo Beni actually led a group of Garifuna to Belize in 1832 as a result of the Civil War. And it, because they represent, they again fought against Francisco Morazan. And that's why, the, uh, that's why Garifuna Settlement Day in Belize is recognized as November 19th. And also Dan Griga town is recognized as the Garifuna cultural capital in Belize because that, that was what they settled uh, out there. But it was the, the fact that we participated in the independence fight on both sides. Uh, and, and again, we fought in, we, and it has to do with the fact that we fought the British for over 30 years. So the Spaniards knew that we had, as I write, as I write in the book, uh, my ancestors are courageous, tenacious people who love freedom and because of their freedom, they fought the greatest powers of the time. And again, even though they were fighting the greatest power, the British, uh, uh, the, the British empire, they couldn't, they couldn't subdue us. And it's, so, and usually when I talk about all of this, I like to say, and in spite of their wishes to exterminate us, in spite of genocide, in spite, in despite of taking over our lands and so forth, guess what? 225 years later, here we are. So who really won the war? And we did. And you know, interesting fact, you mentioned um, November 19th, Discovery Day for Belize. Um, interesting mm -hmm. fact, November 19th is the Puerto Rico Discovery Day too. It's the feast of um, Virgen de la Providencia. It's considered the, you know, uh, our pr Discovery Day as well. Uh -huh. um, so another connection um, with the two communities. And I just want to make sure I answered. Well, you have Bob. to put discovery in. <laughs> you know, well, you know. <laughs> discovery in, it depends on who you who, who, who you discovered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but and I want to just make sure I asked um Bob Ramos. I, I think did, I don't hope I answered. I asked the question because he wanted to know did the Garifuna join with the English against the Spanish at uh, some point? Um, but I don't no, know if that was sort of answered. Actually, that was again from from history. That was the wish of the British was that. All, my ancestors would actually join in against the Spaniards because they, that, that, the, that's the war that was going on. Uh, you know, and again, for, uh, for those people who, today Roatan is t a tourist paradise. Uh, it's actually the Bay Island, which is made up of three islands. Roatan is the, the largest one, is Guanaja, Utila, and other small islands. And that is uh, the 18th Department of Honduras, which is known other state, which is known as the Bay Island. At that time, the Bay Island was British territory. As a matter of fact, the Bay Island did not become part of Honduras until 1861. 40 years later, after 40 years after independence, was when it became part of, part of Honduras. So that's why the fighting was going on with the British, because that was that was their, their settlement. And that's why they took us there, supposedly so that we could fight the Spaniards. Well, the Spaniards knew our history as, again, fighters. And guess what they did? They allowed us to cross to the mainland. They allowed us to settle in Honduras. Uh, they allowed us to uh, settle in Guatemala and, and Belize and Nicaragua. And again, and eventually we joined forces with them. And not to fight the, as a matter of fact, yeah, because uh, uh, according to history, it is documented, the Garifuna defended the city of Trujillo, which at that time, Trujillo is the first capital of Honduras. Uh, before it moved to Comayagua and before it, mm -hmm. now Tegucigalpa, it was Trujillo. And the Garifunas defended that city against British attacks. Mm -hmm. Not one time, many times. 
So no, they didn't join the British. They joined the Spaniards to fight against the British. And again, of course, perhaps maybe it's the fact that we recognize that guess who forcibly deported us there? The British. Mm -hmm. What reason did we have to support it? Yeah. Uh, that you answered my question because I was wondering how did the Spanish receive you? So you answered my question. Yeah. We, we also have another question from um, Professor Bob Ramos. Mm -hmm. He said, when you, and we have a few other questions I'll get to, but first, um, Professor Bob Ramos says, what kind of music did you listen to when growing up? Was it different um, from what you continued listening to when you came here um, to the United States? So when you were growing up, what did you listen to? Uh, very good question. Uh, música en español, música en inglés. <laughs> No, it was, again, remember I said, I didn't know anything about history, uh, but I did know the culture because I was, again, I was born in a garrison village and for Christmas and uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Trujillo also celebrates San Juan Bautista, just like Puerto Rico. So, you know, that La Feria is, is in, uh, in, in Junio, San Juan Bautista. So we, and during those times, you know, that, that was the exposure to the, to, to the culture uh, and so forth. But as far as music listening, uh, first of all, there was no for the music on the radio. Uh, the, my father did operate a social club, which was the only club where Garifuna school dance. Uh, so and at that time, so I knew and basically what the groups played was mostly uh, Garif uh, Spanish, Spanish music. I would listen to the radio and I still remember uh, at 5 a.m. the radio would go on and it would be Luis Aguilar, Antonio Aguilar, Rancheras. Uh, that's what my mother would listen to. And then Mexican, music, yeah. Mexican music, exactly. And I, and, and I say that because the other, my son was the first one that I explained that to you. Uh, I said, son, when I was growing up, we didn't talk about the United States of America. We talk about Mexico. Mexico was the cultural capital of Latin America. As I used to mm -hmm. hear young people say, oh, voy a estudiar a la Universidad Autónoma de México. That's what I heard. And the, the music, uh, the movies, everything dealing with culture was from Mexico. Mm -hmm. and that's what we were. So it was rancheras, it was Mexican music. Then it was during the, the day, it was again more Mexican music, Enrique Guzman, uh, and, and, and so on, that whole generation of rock and roll and so forth. And in between, though, there was also English music. Uh, I, I told young people, I remember the beginning of what is now called reggae. It was called ska. I heard that in Honduras as a child. And then eventually in Boston, when I got to you know about Bob Marley, was when I figured out that, oh, that was the beginning of, that's what Scott, what became eventually reggae and, and so forth. So we listened to a whole diverse type of music. And, oh, and, and at the same time, because uh, let's not forget that uh, Honduras is in the North Coast on the Caribbean side. It faces Jamaica, it faces Cuba, it faces Haiti. And at night, all of those radio stations will filter into it and it also, uh, the radio station from Belize. So we got, grew up listening to all kinds of music, mostly Spanish music, mostly Mexican music. So you're being bombarded by Mexican music, Cuban music, uh, music from the English speaking islands, like uh, at the time ska. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you heard Calypso as well from Trinidad Calypso. and Tobago. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, man, amazing. Now, did you, at the time growing up there, did you hear any uh, music like, for example, rhythm and blues or, or soul music, like from the Motown sound. Did you hear any artists like that growing up? Oh, yeah. Like I said, it was uh, mostly Mexican. But, it, uh, you know, I, I still, uh, you know, like growing up in La, in La Ceiba, it was Radio El Patio, Radio San Isidro. Radio El Patio was the hip station. And then at night, it was, uh, it would be one hour of romantic Mexican music. Next thing you know, it'll be... English music, R and B, and 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 so forth. Uh, and, and it had, and I, I'll say this: it has to. And at that time, there was no such thing as Honduran music. And, and the only music, Honduran music that I remember listening to was in school: folkloric music, patriotic, you know, el himno nacional, la música típica. Uh, that was it. But as far as to say, and, and you know, what's interesting that. Uh, 68 years later, you know, what, what is the Garifuna? It was, was Honduras popular music, Punta, Garifuna mm. music. But mm. back then there was no such thing. Again, it was, it was folkloric, uh, but there was no specific Honduran music. Most of the bands, and I know because my dad used to hire most of them, basically they, they would play what was being played on the radio. 
uh, play it their way. But it was, again, it, at the time it was merengue, it was cumbia, it was da danzón, bolero, uh, you know, Tito Puente, Machito, and, and, and all of that. And from Cuba, uh, Celia Cruz, I remember listening to uh, La Sonora Matancera con Celio González, mm -hmm. and, and on and on. That was, that was basically what I grew up with. I, I, I don't remember uh, a Honduran artist from my childhood. What what about like on the holidays like Guanagra and stuff and we we oh, think yeah. of like the drum music here so did you hear like the drum music and that too like during holidays or other yeah times? I'm talking about radio and I'm talking about the general population but again growing up going to Trujillo for Christmas that was the big thing it was you know the, the, in Trujillo there were two cultural clubs Los Tigres y los Mazapanes uh, this in Garifuna villages. Uh, the cultural clubs are run by women. Uh, so in the traditional rhythm is called hugu uh, which is basically a call and response with the drum. You see, we've seen it many times with Lou Solis at the Bronx Music Heritage Center uh, in, 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 in her group. So that was the tradition. The Wanaragua, yes, absolutely. Uh, during Christmas, there was this one that is little bit known because it's mostly just in Honduras, El Indio Barbaro. Uh, which is actually a recreation of the Carib Indian from St. Vincent and the Grenadine. Uh, there's a, the new generation has act, still maintains it, and it, they actually had brought it to New York, uh, especially during Central American independence uh, season in, in September. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, Elena, yeah, in, in Garifuna, I have a whole tradition for Christmas. <laughs> Uh, there's the Guanaraga, Guanaraga, there's the uh, Warini, there's the Pija Manadi, and on and on. There is a whole celebration from Christmas up until the first, with the Warini being the conclusion of the Christmas season. So while here we talk about uh, 6 de Enero, uh, como el Día de los Reyes, we call it el Día del Warini, which is basically the conclusion of the Christmas season, de Garifuna way. Once again, we take the tradition, the local tradition, we adapt it, and then we turn it into our way. So a couple more music questions. Really, someone wants to know, Jason Torres wants to know, who was your favorite artist growing up? Who would you say was your favorite? The first time, that, the first, the, my all time favorite artist is Bob Marley. And it was because I listened to James Brown. I listened to the Jackson 5. I listened to all of that, all of those groups. I mean, the whole R&B. But Bob Marley was my, my first impression of someone that I could identify with as an immigrant, and not just an immigrant, a black immigrant in the United States of America. And it was actually, this happened in Boston in high school. Uh, I had a friend, a, a schoolmate, uh, his, his name was Ronald. And Ronald, was, I don't know why, but Ronald was bringing me 45. He said, oh, this is the hottest thing. And then I'll give him a, a dollar or two and so forth, get home. Eventually, he, he will bring me. But it was uh, through in high school that I was introduced to Bob Marley. And as I started listening to his music, I, as I started reading his story, I identified. As a matter of fact, in the book, I call chapter three, uh, being in Dallas, <laughs> I call it my mental emancipation. <laughs> And that comes from listening to Bob Marley's uh, song where he says, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. So that was, that's what that comes from. And that's what I mean when uh, Bob Marley was the biggest influence. And I, although I listened to a lot, he's my all time favorite. So and one, and one more qu um, music question before we move on. Mm -hmm. Can you explain Punta versus Punta Rock? Sure. Sure. Who's asking the question? Elena? Oh, Bob Ramos. Bob Ramos. <laughs> <laughs> we have the students have a bunch of questions, which I'm going to get to. I will get that, that, to. That's so. okay. That, that's good. Punta is traditional. Punta is the traditional uh, Garifuna music. Punta rock is the first modern Garifuna genre. And the difference is that Pan Cayetano in 1978 took the Garifuna rhythms of the drums and so forth and combined the electric guitar. He was young and rock was the hot thing out there. So he added the guitar, he added the, um, the organ and, and all those keyboard instruments. So that's the difference between punta rock and punta. It's the punta is traditional, it's the two drums, la, la primera y la segunda uh, is, is again, is, happy music and so forth. Punta Rock 
is the creation of the new generation. And again, it's the addition of uh, electronics to get different music. So I want to switch now. We're, we'll get back to some questions that people have for you, but I wanted to talk, get to New York. Mm -hmm. And when we come to New York, you know, you talk about, um, you mentioned in your book, there's this invisibility of the Garifuna diaspora. Um, probably called one of the reasons, I mean, the, the being Afro-Latino, as you mentioned earlier, people don't know, like, are you African-American? You know, or, where are you from? You know, so there's that, but there's also the fragmentation caused by nationality, being a transnational community. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it, you know, how do you people identify? Do they identify as Honduran, Nicaraguan, or Garifuna? So, you know, so there's been there's this invisibility to the Garifuna diaspora, and unfortunately, there was a really tragic um, occurrence in New York City in 1990, which um, I don't know if a lot of the young people on who are w watching this right now know about. Um, and you know, at first I asked you earlier, I don't know if we, you know, do we talk about this because it's the the one thing that a lot of people talk about with the Garifuna community the Happy Land Social Club fire. Mm -hmm. But it's like something you don't want to be defined just by tragedy. But it really is sort of like this like jumping off point for the Garifuna community um, in New York City and probably elsewhere. Can you just um, explain to people who don't know and, and talk about the Happy Land um, Club fire? Absolutely. Um, well, this is the 34th anniversary of when, when I started. In between that, uh, now is what the... Yeah, the thirty-second anniversary of the Happy Land. Yeah, so there's a two-year difference uh, of the Happy Land Social Club fire, uh, which happened right here in the Bronx. Uh, it was it was a nightclub, social club, uh, which actually was operated at that time by a very manager, and it was actually uh, very popular with young very people, and and they attended. And uh, March twenty-fifth, nineteen ninety. Uh, a Cuban immigrant yeah, showed up at the door. His girlfriend was there taking coats and, and things like that. They got into an, an argument and according to the stories, it's all over uh, the internet. Uh, he left, he came back, had bought a dollar worth of gas, sprayed it at the entrance of, of the club, set it on fire. Uh, well, basically what happened just a few days ago when we lost 17 people right here in the Bronx again in that tower, it was basically a similar experience. What killed the people was actually the smoke that went up the stairs and so forth. People ran in and out. Uh, there were very few survivors. One of them was the DJ who actually came running out of the club engulfing fire and, and he rolled on a uh, at the end of the night, when they finished the count, 87 people perished uh, that night. Most, the, the majority, about 60, 61, were Garifuna young people. And I like to say that it was through the Happy Land Social Club fire that New York City finally recognized the existence of the Garifuna people. And as a matter of fact, now I can add this as my evidence. Every year for the past 13 years, we have gone to Albany, New York to receive the proclamation of Garifuna American Heritage Month from March 11th to April the 12th. As a matter of fact, I just got the draft for this year's proclamation. But every year that we've gone there, he's a friend and he is an elected official, Assemblyman Jose Rivera, who was the council member of that district when it happens. As a matter of fact, he and his family are responsible for the monument that today sits at the corner of Southern Boulevard and Tremont Ave, right in front of what the fire took place. But every year, uh, Assemblyman Rivera would say, when I first got the call and they said there were Hondurans, I expected to see people that looked like me. My surprise when I got there, not only were they Black, they spoke a language that I had never heard. So that's what I mean. There's in the book I, I mentioned and I cited, and I found that quote. Uh, uh, it was a Dominican leader. He, he's passed now, uh, who actually basically uh, states that. So that's what I mean. That New York City discovered the Garifuna population as a result of the Happy Land. And Elena, you and I spoke off camera. No, I don't mind that. That's my story. That's how I was able to get funding to empower the guy from the community. Because prior to that, no one would talk about it because everyone thought it was a sad story. Uh, and it became my elevator speech. When I got to receive um, uh, a, uh, an award from the New York Foundation, I started by saying, I represent a community that up until March 25th, 1990, no one knew. 
the Happy Land Social Club fire, most of the victims were my people, Garifuna. And then I, when I said that, people would come around and say, thank you, I knew about the fire, but I didn't know that. And that basically has become the story of, uh, of our people. So that, that's basically what that is. And, that, and at that time, again, uh, going back to uh, Assemblyman Rivera, his statement, remember what I said earlier, they used to call us Hondureños? Like he said, when I heard they were Hondureños, I told there were people that look like me. And again, there we can see what Elena has alluded to, the fact that there's still people who don't realize that there are people, there are Black people in Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a, a brief history of the Happy Land Social Club. It, it is, uh, you know, again, and it, it, it is sort of a reflection also, interestingly enough, of of our life, our history, because we are a result of a tragedy that happened in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Happy Land Social Club fire is the biggest, the greatest tragedy in Garifuna history in the United States of America. I remember it well because it was just a shocking, shocking thing in the news that evening on TV, all the local stations. It made the national news. Yeah. Of course, in the daily news, the New York Post, the New York Times, you saw that incredibly graphic, sad, horrific picture of all 87 bodies right. lined up on the street. It was just horrific, horrific. And same thing as you just said, that's uh, how I learned what the Garifuna community was. We all did in New York City. Uh, it was a very sad thing too, because uh, the gentleman that caused the fire he was a Cuban Marielito. Exactly. He from Cuba. Yep. And the only reason he was caught was because the gas station where he got the gasoline from was one of the first gasoline stations to install surveillance cameras, which oh. was a new thing at the time. And that's how they he was caught. Really? The girl that he was, uh, his girlfriend that he had to fight with that worked at the club was Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it just, you know, uh, of course, uh, white Americans, you know, it's like, oh, look, the Cubans, Puerto Ricans, mm -hmm. uh, these people from Honduras, they call guy, you know, it's, it became a whole mishmash of politics, etc. And the unfortunate thing about it, too, David Dinkins, the then mayor, the next day closed down every nightclub right. in New York City right. for several, for about a week or two. And then that affected the New York City salsa scene, yep. because every place that did not have proper uh, uh, licensing from the fire mm -hmm. department was inspected, etc. They closed down, and that 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 started the beginning of the destruction of the salsa scene in New York City, because many of those nightclubs provided work for Latin musicians exactly. in the salsa world. So, but at the same time, the fire codes were enforced. Buildings were made safer. There was another subtext to it. The owner of the building was Jay Weiss, right. who was married to the Hollywood star actress Kathleen Turner. Right. So he and her had to do a press conference, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, it was. <laughs> did anything come of that? Did he set up a scholarship fund or anything? Did he pay any reparations or money to the Garifuna community to the families that lo lost? Uh, the loved ones in the tragedy. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, no. Hmm. Uh, and it was not just Sam. You, you are, you're right. He agreed. I, I, yeah, and I, I have all the documentation. He agreed to pay 60, contribute $60,000. Well, then president of Honduras, Rafael Leonardo Callejas, uh, at the um, St. Patrick Cathedral during the mass for the fire, said that he will contribute, I think it was $10,000. Uh, the bishop of the Catholic Church said that he will match that and, and so forth. And uh, then Mayor Dinkins contributed a lot. And all of this was to build a club so the Garifuna people will have space where to entertain, where to conduct, whatever we wanted to. It will be within one complex. 
32 years later, it doesn't exist. I mentioned that in the book. There, wow. were, ma there were many efforts. Uh, there is a chapter, I forget exactly, oh, there's a chapter in the book that I title The Aftermath of the Happy Land Social Club Fire. Because everyone talks about the fire, but it has many consequences that are still being felt. So that's why I call it the aftermath of the Happy Land Social Club fire. Uh, well, there was a, 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 an organization that tried it. There were three different organizations that tried to uh, sort of raise campaigns. And, but up until now, 32 years later, nothing came out of it for the Gunnison community, except the monument that sits at Southern Boulevard and Tremont Avenue. Well, and it, who, it, it, you it, said it, Jose Rivera um, yeah, was yeah. responsible for that. So he got the money for, the, yeah. for that money? He was a city councilor at the time. And he was the one that uh, basically lobbied. And he was the one that was responsible for uh, in getting it built. And, and it, the monument itself has the names of all the people that yeah. Exactly, of all 87 victims. And where is, where, is where is it specifically located? So any of our viewers who are, sure. might want to pay homage to the community mm -hmm. can go there and visit it. It's right at the corner of um, Southern Boulevard and Tremont Avenue. And as a matter of fact, that intersection right there is, is Southern Boulevard, but uh, there is, it, said it has been cold named Boulevard 87. Mm. That's the monument's name, yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting. So, Bobby, you're saying that, like, you know, the this tragedy changed um, the salsa scene. Yeah. And it also, but it did change the Garifuna community because, it, you, like you said, so there was, um, you know, there's um, some groups started, right? We're gonna, I'm going to get into some of the organizations in the Garifuna mm -hmm. community. Before we start that, though, one of the things which um, is really amazing, on page 128, you mentioned... Um, you refer to this gentleman, Aston Jacobo, who was a Dominican exactly. activist, right. which is really interesting. So I'm reading your book and I'm reading about him. And then about a week and a half ago, David Gonzalez, a New York Times reporter, just wrote a big piece in the New York Times um, about the fire, like this idea that the Bronx is defined by fires from yeah. the fires of the 60s and 70s, um, the Happy Land fire, which he talks about. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, now the recent Twin Parks building mm -hmm. fire. It seems like our borough is, is, is that's how it's you know it has these um timeline this timeline and how it's defined and he talks about Aston Jacobo so he was a really recognizable um <laughs> person in the community um and really um did he work closely with the Garifuna community? He did actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I the reason I eventually looked him up was I actually met him. Uh, I was right after I moved here. I was invited to a Garifuna leadership meeting. Uh, by a Garifuna or organization, and I attended. And Aston was one of one of the attendees, and I never forgot him because he was one of the main speakers, and he was sitting at the main table. He was one of the first ones to speak, and I never forget him because this is what he said to us. The sad thing about the Happy Land Social Club fire is the fact that you Garifunas were the victims, and. We, Dominicans, were the beneficiaries of that fire. And that is sad, but that is the truth. And the reason we didn't benefit was because you were not organized. He was absolutely right. That's what he told us. And I never, so, so I, I looked at him when I found that quote in the New York Times, that's why I included it with, 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 with reference because it's like he validates everything. Uh, but yes, he, uh, he was, a, uh, and as a matter of fact, he, uh, he, he even gave us examples. It, it, it was still when uh, the Bronx was being rebuilt after you know the Bronx is burning and all of that. And he said, look at that. You know who got, who got uh, if you look around the happy man, he said, you know who got those new houses there? It was us, Dominicans, he says. You guys didn't get anything, but it was a wake up call. A wake up call, but yes, that's why I quote him. And again, I, I, I and it, interestingly enough, that was the only time I got to meet him because soon after he passed, he passed away. Oh wow! wow. Um, but it's just interesting. His name just has come up, um, you yeah. know, a couple of times. But it, David's, I would suggest anyone to check out David's article. is really amazing. Um, so Jose, you were so you were you in New York already when the Happy Land fire happened? You know, it's, it's just, uh, people are surprised when I tell them. No, I was not. As a matter of fact, I, I did most of my, most of the work that I did uh, up until 1998 when I moved here, uh, I did it flying planes. Uh, and the story that I tell, I used to leave 
I, I was in Dallas and I used to leave Dallas on Monday morning, get on a plane. And I usually I will come back either Thursday or Friday. But once after 1989, after that first meeting, it didn't matter where I went because back then connecting flights were cheaper and I was fine. I was flying for the corporation. So that, you know, as long as the airfare air, air was not too high. So it didn't matter where I went. I was, I was connected to New York. So I went to L. I was going to LA before I went to Dallas. I will connect to New York and then you know stay here to take care of business during the weekend and so forth. I went to Chicago, and, and that's basically how I did it. And that's why I value and appreciate the lady who I'm honoring tonight, uh, Dionisia Amaya Bonilla Miss Nicha, because she, she was my guard here she was i mean we used to speak on a regular basis and she was the one that kept the activity she was the one that uh, organized and so forth uh but no i was i was as a matter of fact uh, speaking about the fire the way i found found out about the fire i was in dallas texas and around 3 a.m my telephone rang and i answered the telephone and it's one of my sisters from boston and before, I mean, I, as soon as they picked it up, she is sobbing. She's crying on the phone. Mm -hmm. And all she said was, have you heard from Tom, my brother, my twin brother? I said, no, why? She said, there is a big fire in New York. Turn on CNN. Turn on CNN, she said. And there is a big fire in New York, and he's there, and we haven't heard anything from him. Oh, my God. So uh, as I said, well, I haven't either. But you know what? I have contacts in New York. Let me make a few calls and I'll call you back. And that's what I did. And one of the first people that I called was my uncle, uh, who was also my godfather at the time. Uh, and I called him and he said, no, I, well, I haven't seen him, but I can almost assure you that he's not there. Because from knowing you and him, he wouldn't, that's not the type of place that he will visit. He said, but if I hear anything, I will uh, let you know. So I said, okay, dear. So I, so, and I called back my sister back and so forth. And, and my brother tells the story a couple of hours later, he calls to let him know that he's fine. And, and he's the same thing. It's like, everybody's crying. And at the same time, this time, a, a tears of happiness to know that, that, that he was fine. But you know, I, I was in Dallas, Texas. And, and again, that's, that's how I found out about the fight. So the whole diaspora community knew. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That was the first time, that's the first time that I remember seeing my people on national TV. Again, I did, I turned on CNN and I kept watching CNN all day long. And I had never ever seen Garifuna people on national television. Mm -hmm. And all day long, I kept seeing my people. It was not a pleasant experience because again, but yeah. That, so, and again, that's what's when I talk about that. It was through the fire that the city knew, it got to know us and not just the city, but basically the world, because remember at that time, CNN was the global news. It was not just national, it was not inter international, uh, but yes. So in, in terms of the organizations that grew out of that, there were, you know, you said that you said it was slow um, to, to happen, but there were some organizations that were around pr prior to this. There was um, the Carib American Association, you said was the first Garifuna organization registered in New York State Correct. back in 1946. Right. There was the Phoenix Social Club, kind of mm -hmm. like a happy land, a social club, 1959. A Honduras Football and Social Club, which yes. was probably Garifuna, a lot of Garifuna exactly. in 1965. So there were a few, right? right? In 1979, there was the Garifuna Social Club, the first one to include Garifuna in its name, you said. Exactly. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about then, so post happy land, the organizations that came out of that, um, talk a little bit about who was organizing them, how they were formed, and you were part of that, I guess, with the Garifuna Coalition as well. So I, maybe talk a little bit about that, and maybe a focus on the Bronx too is always nice. So. <laughs> sure, you know, uh, uh, yeah, and you just mentioned it, and, and, and actually, what that reflects, uh, and again, I describe it in, in the book. That's why I separated like like that because uh, it reflects. That was this, the typical organizations of immigrants in this country. It was based around hometown associations. Uh, and, and again, but the Carib American is, uh, Association is significant in the sense that it's the first Garifuna nonprofit registered with New York State in 1946. And, 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 the reason, and I emphasize that because it proves what I started saying. Because people talk about, oh, we started arriving after World War II. No, we were here since the 30s. So that means we've been here for 90 years. 
it's 19, and, and I said in, in the, uh, 1946, it's a reflection because usually immigrant groups, we come in, we kind of learn things and it's about 10 years later, we start sitting, really figuring out uh, how to operate. And that's the significance of that. But yeah, but after the Happy Land, uh, again, uh, one of the most notorious one, uh, well, uh, prior to the, to the Happy Land, that's how I met Ms. Dionisia Maya. Uh, she had just organized Mujeres Garinagu en Marcha Pro Educación, which it was a women's organization, basically. And the, the uh, Pro Educación has to do with the fact that it was a lot of the women here in New York who migrated were teachers, but they were not working as teachers because they didn't have all the credentials. So what Mugama was created for was Ms. Amaya was by then working with the um, uh, Department of Education of New York. So she started a program so that that if now women who have been teachers could now take classes here and get you know equivalency and, and all of that. So that's where that came, which is why I also refer to Mujeres Carina and Marcha Pro Educación Mugama as the first modern Garifuna nonprofit. So that was 89. And then after that, you have Hondureños contra el SIDA and, 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 and many, many others. And really the difference is that up until that point, except for those organizations that you mentioned, Elena, and I mentioned in the book, uh, most of the hometown association were and continue to be informal organizations which are not registered with New York State. Two of the oldest California organizations here in New York are part of that group. Uh, well, one of them eventually did incorporate as a, as a nonprofit. The other one continues to uh, actually be uh, unincorporated. Uh, it, but all of that. Now, the most prominent one of that era, which I highlight in the book, is La Federación, uh, La Federación Hondureña de, de Organizaciones Hondureñas en Nueva York, FEDONI. Mm -hmm. uh, that was started by Garifunas, and I know because I was here uh, that weekend uh, for the first meeting. Uh, one of them was the late Juan Marin. Juan Marin was actually one of the founders of the Phoenix Social Club, which, as I mentioned in the book, the Phoenix Social Club was the first Garifuna organization, which is in, in, in its article of incorporation, states as a purpose to build, lease, or rent a center. It's the only organization to include that in, within its purpose. But again, Mr. Juan Marin one, was one of the founders. And he is the one that take along with Ms. Nicha, uh, uh, Ms. Amaya, and many others decide that, you know what? We cannot continue to operate in this disorganized manner. You know, it's like you do in fundraisers, let's come together and create, you know, let's work together. We don't have to start on the let's work together under one campaign. They did that. And then after they came up with the ideas, others from Honduras, not non garifunas heard of the idea. They decided to join in because no, ustedes no son los únicos, somos hondureños. And basically took, took over the, the organization. And that was, that was and the, the significance of that is that it was that organization that actually was working with uh, Mayor Dinkins and, and his office. I, I understand that they got 250,000 of operational revenue to operate. They were able to open an office and they were and again, they were the one that was supposed to manage the building of this complex that still doesn't exist. Uh, but again, Hondureños Contra Cidas is still around. That was 1992, that's me. Uh, this is Mirta Colón, which is one of the most prominent organizations. And as you mentioned, as a result of uh, go, uh, organizing the bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the arrival of the Garifunas to Honduras, we came back in 1997 and it's like, well, how do we keep working together? Uh, it was 21 different organizations. And we, that's when we decided to create the Garifuna Coalition USA Inc. as an umbrella organization. So it was again, 21 uh, organizations, including one of the few ones that remained out of that is uh, actually Lisa's organization, uh, which was called Hamano Nuwayunagu back then. Now it's Wabafu, but it's mm -hmm. the same. So she is one, one, of, one of the founding members of the Garifuna coalition. Uh, and again, uh, it's interesting because up on, uh, I, I smile because 
up to today, I basically remain the only founder of the Garifuna Coalition, which is, uh, and, I, and basically my responsibility is to make sure that it, we continue to comply with all the filing requirements of, of uh, the IRS and New York State. And and, I, and I'll say this sarcastically because there are people who there who say that, oh, what, what is the Garifuna Coalition? What do they do? It is active, it is legal, it is legit. Uh, but yes, uh, but all of that, uh, after the Happy Land Social Club fight, there were about over 20 organizations that were founded in New York. I, and I, I keep track of all the registration, uh, register organizations with New York. And prior to the Happy Land, as you mentioned, there were like maybe 15 from the half from 1990, after Mugama in 1990 <laughs> to now. I just did it recently because I do it on a regular basis. There's about 50 nonprofits registered right here in New York. It's and to your point, and the majority are right here in the Bronx, which is because it, it, it's interesting. Well, and actually, that uh, Fedoni taking over Fedoni, it, it also, and I mentioned it in the book, has to do with the fact that everyone knows, well, everyone, every Honduran will tell you, independent whether they're very or not, will say the same thing because they've said it to me. The Garifunas are the most organized Hondurans in New York City. Mm -hmm. Everyone recognizes that. The problem that I, I, I recognize and identify, which is why I started promoting Garifuna, uh, besides the identity, was that that was true until there was time to deal with the government of New York City. And then the attitude became, Oh, no, somos hondureños, y porque somos hondureños, nosotros tenemos que dirigirlos. And the ones that were saying nosotros tenemos que dirigirlos didn't look like us. So, so that was, that's the conflict that we have mm -hmm. faced as, as Garifuna, is the fact that it's not just in Dallas, it's not, it's even within Honduras. It's the fact that everyone, you know, you, you're, you're the most organized, but we don't feel that you qualify, which is interesting because I'm hearing the same thing about Brian Flores right now, right? That's the attitude with the NFL and and overall with professionals here. So you're good to play, what not, but you're not good to administer, you're not good to coach. But again, uh, taking it back, yeah. But, but eventually we did come together as Garifuna with Mirta Colon, and we basically created this front that we will present a united front as Garifuna. And again, here we are, we continue to be the most prominent ethnic group from Honduras, the most recognized uh, from Central America called Garifuna. Well, two Thanks. things you ha you have uh, you said there were uh, the fifty organizations. Are you talking about in total all the different uh, organizations that are in the Bronx that are nonprofit, or you mean there are fifty Garifuna organizations? I just wanted to fifty non nonprofits, not fifty nonprofits that are nonprofit. Garifuna, which are and actually wow. when, I, when I talk about Amazing. Garifuna, because the way I do my search, it was uh, is. For, I look for Garifuna, and there are 50 nonprofits in, in between New York and uh, between Brooklyn and the Bronx. The majority are in the Bronx. There's 50 that have the word Garifuna, either at the beginning or that, uh, as you do the search, contain that the word Garifuna in, in their name. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. And there are others that, uh, and people were surprised when I first came out with the list. And so how do you know? Because I know the community. And, 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 I, and what, what do I mean by that? It's, it's the fact that if it, if it doesn't have the name, I know it more than likely is a hometown association. And because I know all the uh, Garifuna towns from in Central America, then I started search. And I'll give you an example, which was interesting to me. So one, one, of, the one of the communities in Honduras is, Cor is Corozal. So I found this organization called Corozal. I sent uh, the fee to New York State to get the articles of incorporation. It was Corozal in Puerto Rico, not Honduras. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it goes to speak to the history of the Puerto Rican community here in New York City exactly. as well, because many Puerto Ricans organized clubs, yep, hometown particularly clubs. social That's clubs, right. yeah. based off the name of the hometown that they were from. Exactly. So, exactly. They, you know, if you see a Club Social Rio Piedras or whatever, yep. it would be from that uh, people that came from Puerto Rico from that particular, that particular town, yeah. city, et cetera. Exactly. Now, you mentioned, the second thing is you mentioned uh, Brian Flores. <laughs> Can you bring him up? Who's uh, in the news right now. Oh, yeah. Because he's suing the NFL mm -hmm. for the fact that he found out that they were just jiving him when they were uh, when they said they they were looking for 
black head coaches. Right. And according to the NFL, there's a, I forgot the name of the uh, the rule in the NFL, but every NFL team, when there's an opening for a head coach or any coach at all, right, on the special teams or whatever, they have to buy these bylaws. Mm-hmm. Make sure before they hire, make a decision on hiring Henry, they have to interview a person of color. Right. And in Brian Flores's case, he was interviewed. And then he, after the, after the fact that he found out that the New York Giants really had hired somebody else. Exactly. So, and it turns out that Brian Flores is Garifuna. Exactly. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah. So the reason I'm smiling and the reason I, I picked up my phone is because you know, uh, today, I, I, I read it quickly. This is what I wrote on Facebook about that. The more things change in America, the more they remain the same. I'm reading terms I heard 50 years ago. Good old boy network. You have to be twice, at least twice as good as the best white person. Oh yeah, tokenism. Throughout my corporate career, I was always one of two black people in the EEOC quota system, which has been rebranded diversity. So I get sarcastic here. Look, we comply with the Rooney rule And 20 years later, we have our token, Mike Tomlin, head coach in the Pittsburgh Steelers. What are you people complaining about? Congratulations, Brian Flores. Uh, Yes, uh, because that that is the news. We uh, we spoke off camera. Uh, 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 Social media is buzzing with Karim Funes coming to his support. And and that was the way of expressing, uh, again, basically what the book is about. Is the fact that here it is, 52 years later after my I migrated. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I've said to my wife and a few friends, you know, it's amazing because we have gone back 52 years. Because when I came to America, exactly what's going on right now with race is exactly what we were dealing with. And here we are, 52 years later. Uh, again, and it's uh, I, I tell young people, you know, one of the reasons that. I, I, and with the Garifuna Coalition, I emphasize the youth, developing youth leadership. I would tell them, I grew up in the environment where I saw that people that became professional left the community. And the best dressed person was the drug dealer. So if a young person sees that, what, who are they going to imitate? So I decided to provide an alternative to that. Uh, again, but, so, so, but it, it's my way of reflecting that. That's why I wrote sarcastically that it's not new. The sad thing is that we have made to believe that t- things have improved. Uh, and, and what's even worse, that was 20 years when uh, the, the Rooney role was passed. But I was, why? Because I've been following it up and I was listening that it was 34 years ago. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the same time that I started all of this, 34 years ago was when the first black coach was hired in the NFL. And 34 years later, there's only one. And the, the sad thing with Brian is that he was fired with a winning record. Uh, the and, Miami and, Dolphins. And, well, the <laughs> Miami Dolphins, exactly. But yes, he is Garifuna. His parents, um, he's still Garifuna descent. His parents were born in, uh, in, uh, in Honduras. He was born in Brooklyn. I, actually, I saw him on CBS yesterday when he was, and he says, I was born not too far from here. Yeah, in, in, in Brooklyn, in the projects. I know the projects where, where his mother, uh, his parents lived. Of course, they no longer live there. Uh, but yes, he, he is Garifuna. And he is, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I wrote an article uh, when he got h- hired uh, two or three years ago, when even when they just started talking and, and, and so forth. But yes, uh, and, and Bobby, and as I mentioned, as I went, and we were uh, off camera, Brian is the reason that I ref- basically say about us, Garifuna, is the fact that we didn't just survive, we have thrived. Because we have people like Brian Flores at that level and everywhere in between contributing to society, which is how we were able to justify the proclamation of March 11 to April the 12th of every year as Garifuna American Heritage Month, started right here in the Boogie, bon- Boogie Bronx. Then by in the city, and for the past 13 years, uh, as I mentioned, I just reviewed the draft of the co- proclamation for this year, 
in Albany at both at the in the assembly in New York. But yes, Brian Flores is one of us. Well, you know, excuse me, Bobby. Wait, Bob, excuse me for one oh, second. Can Sasha. We, can we, we don't have a lot of time left, and I just want to get to some questions by the students um, okay. who were asking some, um, have asked some questions early on, and I was waiting for them because they were sort of like sort of like more philosophical questions okay. for you, Jose. Just, just real quick, I'd just like to mention one thing in terms of the New York Giants, which our hometown team, which is very, I'm very disappointed in them because with Brian, they would have gotten a head coach that is a winning head coach. Exactly. He's got several Super Bowl rings. He's a black, he's Latino, and he's Garifuna, and exactly. he would have united the whole Latino community in general and black community in New York City as a, 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 as the head coach of the New York Giants. So the New York Giants, if, if anybody from the pu public relations department is watching, you guys really blew it super yep. big time. And it'll be interesting to see how the lawsuit plays out. We'll be watching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, the first question I have is um, from Jason Torres. He said, what do you feel was the biggest struggle in your life? The biggest struggle, I, which I do mention in the book, uh, actually, and I'll say, is a good opportunity for me to share something that I, you know, I have spoken, but not publicly, but I decided to... Uh, the biggest struggle was actually being diagnosed uh, with bone cancer at the age of 17 and being told at 18 that the choices were some type of new drug that had been developed, which happens to be chemo, that it was not practical, or amputating my left leg, which was the decision that was ultimately made by my parents because I was given, uh, basically the choice that they were given was that through the amputation, at least they knew that I would be able to survive. Without it, uh, they basically just guaranteed that I will live for five years. Uh, and now uh, I like to say it when I talk about it, I laugh because I say I was an, eight, uh, I was an 18 year old young man when it happened. I'm a young man of 68 and I'm here <laughs> to tell the story. So oh, yeah, that's the biggest struggle. Great. Um, Reed Luftig um, asks, while assimilating to American culture, what did you specifically do to uphold your identity? I, again, going, uh, because of the conflict of foreigner, are you, uh, that really, again, drew me to my own identity and basically start hanging out with my people. And, 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 and really led me to do research about my, and once I found the story of my people, I decided that, you know what, uh, before I say that I'm Honduran, before I'm say, I'm going to say Garifuna. So if, whenever you ask me, it's like, I'm Garifuna. But it was because of, of, of that rejection that led me to embrace my identity, as I like to say, with dignity. And it continues to now. And um, Pedro Monroy asked, and it's in a similar sort of vein of the same question, when growing up, did you ever have troubles with self-identification when you were younger? If so, how did you feel after you learned and realized who you were? Uh, even though I didn't know who I was, uh, well, I, I knew who we were. And I, I explained that in the book, and I explain it this way. My story is based, it's the same story as President Barack Obama, except for the fact that and it, because in his case, his mother is white, his father was African. My mother was mestizo, okay, which is the equivalent of white, <laughs> people will say, in Latin America. My father is the Garifuna. He's the black man. But unlike with his case, he was raised by his white family. So he had to find his blackness. He had to find that identity. With me, it was the opposite. I was, I was born in my Garifuna grandparents' home. I grew up with my Garifuna family. I grew up listening to the Garifuna language. I grew up experiencing the Garifuna culture. So as a result, I didn't have any identity problems. I knew who I was. What I didn't know was the history of my people. But as far as I, so, so when I get to Boston and I'm called a foreigner, it's the, it's the, uh, I mean, my position is, I don't care what you call me, I know who I am. I'm a Garifuna. And again, I remember my uh, story in, in Dallas when I told the lady, oh, and by the way, I'm Garifuna. What, what's that? Uh, but yeah, no, I, di I didn't have uh, any, uh, any, any problem. But again, 
But my <laughs> advice to any young people who may have that, learn the history of your people. Do your research. If you have grandparents, start interviewing. Talk, talk to them about your, ask them about your heritage. Ask your parents about who you are. And then take that today. There's no reason when I did all of this, I had to go to the library or, or I had to buy a book. Today, all that you got to do is Google Garifuna. A million <laughs> things will, that will show up. Now, having said that, be careful. because There's misinformation and disinformation. But again, the more you know about yourself, the farther you go in life. And I am living proof of that. I can't agree with you more because I, if you know who you are, I tell my students on the college level, uh, nobody can mess with you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, my boy. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, but it saddens me many times when I meet young people that they're not curious about their cultural heritage or their history. Like I'll meet somebody uh, with a, an Italian last name, mm -hmm. and then I speak, start speaking to them. Oh, where? where um, so you're Italian of the Italian descent, and they'll say, No, actually, I'm. I'm Sicilian, but I don't know really where, where I go. Do you speak S the Sicilian language? Because it is different than Italian. Mm -hmm. Nah, just a few words. It goes. I, I, I they talk like they, they're not even curious exactly. at all. Exactly. I go. Are your grandparents alive? I go. One of them is. I go. You better talk to them. That's right. You gotta talk to them because once they're gone, that's it. And yeah. you'll you'll be, you'll 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 be surprised what you learn. And. Thank you. Uh, uh, you'll be very proud of it as well. Yeah. And, and to that point, quickly, what I told my son was, son, it's better, and I'm telling this to young people, it's better to self-identify. And I told my son, because if you don't, somebody else will identify and try to define you, and it's not going to be pleasant. And we, right, and we live in a world today when you meet a kid that goes, well, my father's Peruvian, but my mother is uh, New Yorican. Exactly. And I go... That's even better. You That's got right. even more to draw upon. That's right. Know, so. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I just want to um, I just want to round out by just um, concluding with something you started off with. You had mentioned um, the Club Cubano, how you um, start out your meeting at the Club Cubano, um, one of your early meetings way back in like 1989. And um, the Club Cubano has a really interesting um, history. It's a, it's a Cuban social club, but it's a exactly. social club for Afro Cubans, and exactly. they specifically made it because of the racism within the Cuban community, they were, the, the Afro-Cubans weren't led into white clubs, so they formed their own. And the Club Cubano was a really important um, uh, so, social club, was an important a venue for Latin music, all kinds of Cuban music, so in political events and, and, uh, and cultural events. So, um, so it's just kind of like coming back full circle to, to that yes. story. And I just want to say thank you, Jose. Um, I actually have a bunch more questions. There's so I, much I more to talk about because um, we didn't even get into like there's um, the UNESCO, you know, mm -hmm. the UNESCO, the United Nations has, um, you know, named the Garifuna language an intangible cultural heritage. The Garifuna month from March 11th to April 12th every year, everyone mm -hmm. should look out for what's going on. Um, you know, within around the around the New York City area, Bob Ramos. I'm sorry, I didn't get to a couple of your questions. You had even more questions, um, but there was there was a lot to talk about. But I want to thank you so much, Jose, because this has been really great. Just let people know where can they um, find the book if sure. they want if they want to read more about your story. Uh, first of all, thank you, you and Bobby. Thank you for uh, to be at MHC, MHC for the support for this past. Wow, that we're going into 12, uh, 14 years. I, I have enjoyed it. No, Elena, I am happy because the questions that I got are not typical. And this gives a totally different perspective to the guy from the history. So I'm very pleased with the question because everything else you can find on the internet, but the questions that were asked are personal and at the same time, unique to the culture. The book is available on Amazon. Uh, is both in English and Spanish. You can find it. Uh, the title is Pan, Pan Garifuna, Afro-Latino Power of Pride, My Quest for Racial uh, Ancestral Herit Her Her Heritage, Ethnic and Cultural Identity. And by the way, I, when I say that, I mentioned that Pan, no Pan, is not bread. In, in English, it's all okay, like the Pan American or the Pan African. Uh, but again, it's available on on on, on Amazon. And if anybody has any questions, it's very easy. Uh, my email is Jose Francisco Avila, my first and all my full name, at gmail.com. Jose Francisco Avila at gmail.com. And if you have any questions, I'll just send me an email, and I'll be glad to respond. Thank you very much, Bobby. Thank you very much, Elena.
so and we want to thank everyone who tuned in tonight um next um next wednesday there'll be a virtual event to um a, a, the middle branch the, the middle branch country library um in long island i'll be doing a virtual tour of music um venues of new york of the bronx some like jazz and hip hop venues that are part of the Bronx. So um, go on our Facebook page. You can find out more about that. That's next Wednesday on the 8th. We also do want to thank Jorge Vasquez for making all the technology work tonight, making it happen tonight. And um, again, thank you, Jose Francisco. Um, we will see you um, definitely at the at the Bronx Music Heritage, the Bronx Music Hall when we open okay. the new space. So um, thank, thank you so much. And Bobby, I'll let you close out. And before we close out, again, thank you, Maestro Jose Francisco Avila. Thank you also to the Garifuna community, who we're very proud of, uh, of in our extended family in Latino America. Uh, somos todos uno, y con fuerza siempre y con H, with positive energy. Thank you, Maestro Jorge Vasquez, for being in Command Central, behind the scenes, making this all possible. Thank you to everyone watching. Make sure you visit the Bronx Music Heritage Center a Facebook page, and we'd also like to let you know of a special event this Saturday honoring the late, great Hector Tito Matos, who was a fantastic Puerto Rican percussionist who was the avatar, the living embodiment of one of our African-rooted uh, music forms born in Puerto Rico, the plena tradition. He just passed away two weeks ago at the young age of 53. He was a fantastic master of the panderetas, the frame drums that have no jingles that we use in the plena, a master of the requinto, the solo drum that talks. He was a virtuoso, great vocalist as well, the co-leader along with Ricardo Pons and Alberto Toro and founder of Viento de Agua that brought the plena into the 21st century. And this Saturday, there will be a special event in his honor. Elena, if you could tell us a little bit about it, it's at the Andrew Friedman home in uh, the Bronx and the Grand Concourse. So if you could tell us a little bit about it so people can attend it. Actually, I'm gonna let Jorge come on really quick and tell us because you, or Jorge is one of the organizers and can tell you the exact address and time of it. All right, I made a, a of uh, uh, music by the book. <laughs> Can you appear? <laughs> uh, first, I want to say, uh, Jose, great, great. I learned a lot about the Garifuna community. Um, I know I work with several Garifuna uh, people, yes. and I always talk to them, and they're very proud, and they always say they're Garifuna, and they're students younger than me. So what you're doing is, is great. Thank All you. Right. Cool. All right, so Tito Matos, the event is on Saturday, the Andrew Freeman Hall. Home, uh, you can search it. Is uh, I don't have the address right on with me, but it's by 167th Street, the Grand Concourse in the Bronx is very close to the stop on the D train, mm -hmm. um, and it's from 6 to 10 p.m. It's going to be a uh, uh, broadcast live also by BronxNet. So uh, stay tuned if you want. You can go to my Facebook page. There's information, or you can go to the Bronx Music Heritage uh, Facebook page. There's there's information there. Um, and my, my Facebook is jvasquez25, and you, you can check the information there as well. Thank you. And um, so we'll, we'll see you guys, everyone, either on, on a virtual event or a live event soon. Thank you all, and have a great night. Thank you. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Oh, Buenas noches. One, more, one more thing. That's, again, wait, wait, wait. That's Saturday. Long goodbyes. Long goodbyes. <laughs> That's why, of course, Puerto Ricans, it takes us 10 times longer to say goodbye than say hello, just like the Garifuna. You know? Exactly. <laughs> Latino in general. <laughs> So Jorge, the event produced by Jorge and Matthew Gonzalez and several of his colleagues this Saturday, please attend that, if you, especially from the Puerto Rican community, to one, honor one of our incredible, incredible musicians who is no longer with us. But uh, Friday, tomorrow, I will be honoring on my internationally broadcast radio show, The Latin Jazz Cruise on WBJO FM 88.3. Uh, you can listen on the computer, wbgo.org. That's W, B as in Bobby, G as in God, O as in Oscar, dot org. From 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be honoring the late great from Brazil. She just passed away last week at the age of the young age of 91, Elsa Suarez, the incredible Afro-Brazilian vocalist who brought back the African into uh, popular music in Brazil. And the late, great Mark Levine, 
who just passed away as well, the incredible P jazz and Latin jazz pianist, composer, arranger, and band leader, the author of two of the most incredible books, the Jazz Piano Book and the Jazz Theory Book. Every college, university level jazz program has these books. And Mark led the incredible Latin Tinge, Latin Jazz Group. I will be honoring both of them uh, this Friday night, wbgo.org, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. If you can't listen to the show live, you can listen the next day in the archives or thereafter. Just type in WBGO Latin Jazz Cruise. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Jorge. Welcome. Thank you, Maestra Elena. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Elsa Suarez, and Maestro Hector Tito Matos, and Ma Ma Maestro Mark Levine for this evening. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Mucho Bye-bye. Okay.